If you will turn in your Bibles to the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you'll remember that Paul was writing this letter to the church that was located in Corinth. And remember that Corinth is a very worldly, godless city. That is the environment that that these believers have come out of and the environment that they are living in. And so Paul began his letter with the typical salutations to them. And then he jumps right into the, the first issue. And the underlying issue that's going on is that these believers that are there in Corinth, they're immature and they have allowed the carnality of the world to enter into the church. They're saved. They've accepted Jesus Christ, but they haven't grown and matured in their faith. Instead, rather, they have invited the world into the church and they see things through the lens of the world. So they're trying to build the spiritual kingdom of God, but they are seeking worldly implements and tools and perspectives to be able to do this. This has now given them a distorted picture of Christianity and of the spiritual kingdom that we are to be participating in. So Paul is trying to write this letter and he's going to deal with quite a bit of correction in this letter as they have steered off the path of the foundation of Christ and they have been led astray and invited the world into their church. So the very first issue that Paul begins to deal with is the divisiveness that has entered into the church. Now, God's desire is unity and the enemy's desire is division. And one of the first representations that we're going to see of the enemy at work is when we start to develop strife and division and competition. When, when that is there, the the enemy's work is in full bloom right there. And so what had happened is that in Corinth, they were competing with each other for status as Christians. So which Christians have more status in the church than the others? And this competition now, this was bringing about strife and division. Once you allow competition to enter into the kingdom of God, you are going to tear it apart. Competition is going to tear apart. And we see that the disciples, one of the things that Jesus was constantly dealing with the disciples on, they wanted to know, Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? They were competing with each other for position in the kingdom of God. And so here we see that they are now competing in their Christianity with each other. So what are they doing? They are now seeking greater status as Christians. And the way that they were doing it was by attaching themselves to different leaders, thinking this now would make them a better Christian if they were attached to a better leader. And so status by association, that's the world. But the byproduct of that, the underlying element of that is in order to compete with who you are attached to, you have to step back and start to evaluate which leaders are better leaders than others. So now you have these Christians who are judging the apostles and the other leaders, these great instruments that God is using to build the kingdom, and they're starting to rank them. They're coming out with their top 10 leaders list and the polls you know, amongst them so that now they know who to attach themselves to. Some people would say, well, I'm of Paul. Others would say, yeah, no, 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 Ah, Apollos, baby, you know, that's who I'm following. The others are like, no, no, Cephas, Peter, the rock, you know, that's who I'm following. And so now we have them competing with each other for status. And and you remember how Paul dealt with that. He's like, don't you understand? There's one head. Christ, that's who we're following. And whoever is helping you, has that has nothing to do with the relationship that you have with Christ. He's the head over the church, and we are all to be connected. So stop with this, well, I follow him and I follow him because we all follow Christ. He says, and now you guys are also, you're taking your competition to not only who you are following, but listen to this, who you got baptized by. 
Because that's going to make you a better Christian. You know, if you got baptized by this person, you know, or this person over here baptized you, or this person over here baptized you. And how ridiculous that starts to sound, To that's going to affect how your walk is with the Lord, who you got baptized by. And do you remember what Paul says about that? He says, I'm glad I didn't do a lot of baptizing. My ministry was, remember, it wasn't to baptize people, it was to preach the gospel. And then he talked a little bit about the, the challenges of preaching the gospel, the cross. And how the cross of the Jew, stumbling block. To the Gentile, it's foolishness. And, but yet, to us who believe, it is the power to save us and to redeem us. And, and so then Paul you know, moves from there. Because what they were doing, Paul's telling them, is you're embracing worldly wisdom. This is one of your chief problems. There are two lenses in the world. There's the lens of looking at everything through the world's lens. And then there is the lens of the word of God. And we are looking through one or the other of those lenses. Now, what Paul was saying is that we need to stop listening. We need to stop looking through the lens of the world because we've been given a new lens. The lens from the creator who made everything that is around us. This is the lens where everything comes into true focus. And the world's wisdom... The the world is leading us away from God. The world is not leading us towards God. So we need to make sure that we are keeping the right lens on. He talked about the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And he said, and the difference between those two is that with the wisdom of God, there's the power of God that's behind it. The wisdom of the world is just empty words. But the wisdom of God, the power of God dwells there. He jumped back into now, once again, letting them know that this division, this competition, this competing with one another, it's carnal. It's carnal. He says, you know, the, the, some people plant the seed and others water. And others are the ones that, that bring in the actual harvest of the Lord. Who was better? Who was more important than the other? We are all part of the process and to God be the glory. And we are just instruments and regardless of what piece or part you played, you are just a participant. No one's more important than the other. And once again, he gets them back to the focusing on the centrality of goodness in God. God is the one that is good. And we need to stop trying to take credit Because again, you know, we're not building Christian resumes to hand before the Lord. You know, I I had 22 and a half saved people in my life, you know, uh, that uh, that I had. I gave myself a half because I, you know, I was praying while the other person was speaking. So, you know, I I mean, it's like you're not, this is ridiculous. It's carnality. It's the world. And, And it had entered into the church. And so Paul is trying to help them to move past this carnal thinking of our Christian faith. But in the absence of teaching and leadership, and Paul wasn't there, this is what is going to happen. Carnality enters into the church. When you stray from the word of God, carnality is going to enter into the church. I believe one of the great challenges of the church in our country today is that we have strayed away from the teaching of the word of God. And when you stray away from the teaching of the word of God, carnality is going to enter in. You're going to start to pull the world's operations and methods and, and even their, their reviews into the church and start to navigate by that instead of by the word of God. And so this is what had happened in the church there. They had started off well, but now they had veered away. And Paul's trying to get them back onto the right track here and get them focused on the Lord. Now, he had talked about the fact that we also, thinking about the power of God underneath the word of God, he tells them that I want you to remember That this isn't a self-help program. That the wisdom of God isn't a self-help program. The wisdom of God comes with the power of God. And when we accepted Christ, we had the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that was imparted in us to start to change us and to help mold us into the image and likeness of Christ. So we have this this power that is inside of us. And so we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, he told them. And that you have got great power that is inside of you. He went on to tell them also uh, that 
we now need to focus on the things of the Lord and to move forwards in those areas. We need to focus on the wisdom that's from God and we need to avoid the wisdom that is from men. Now, Paul is going to circle back to this issue of where they are seeking to gain status as Christians by association. That's the way the world operates. Your status is by who you associate with and name dropping and, and, and all of these things. Trying to connect yourself to someone who has more status connects you and your status. And so, but Paul is going to go to the root underlying that. And that is that the Christians were sitting there now and rather than learning and growing, they had turned themselves into judges and critics. They were evaluating the various different church leaders. Well, I I like him. I think that he's a good sense of humor, good presentation. What did you put for him? Oh, you didn't? No, I didn't have that. Okay, I'm going to say that too. And now I'm going to move him down then. Who did you say was above him? And and now all of a sudden, this is what they were doing with, with all of the spiritual leaders. They had turned themselves into critics. And here's the issue. They were criticizing Paul. Paul was the spiritual dad. He was the founding pastor that came down. There wasn't even a Christian. And he had preached the message and got them saved and baptized and and got them organized and going. And now they're saying, well, Paul, he's he's not very tall. He doesn't wear nice clothes. What did you think of his oration skills? Yeah, Apollos is better. Yeah, I put Apollos over him. Yeah, Paul, eh, you don't come, you're not ranking very high here in our poll, Paul, you know, and, and all of a sudden now, and he's like, you know, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And, and so he, he, he is going to, to talk to them about the, these criticisms of him as he is being compared to the other church leaders there. And he is going to show them that they are puffed up in pride rather than learning and growing. They have set themselves up as judges as if they've already arrived, as if they're so mature and so spiritually deep that they're even able to compare them. But here's the problem. When they're comparing the church leaders, they're comparing them using the comparisons of the world and not the comparisons that you should be looking at leadership and godly leadership. They don't even understand what a godly leader is supposed to look like. You know what they want? They want, they, they want a rock star pastor. <laughs> you know, that's going to be on the cover of, you know, Christianity Today, you know, the power brokers uh, here and everything. That's what they want. They want a mover and a shaker and someone who, you know, looks the part and, and has it all down. And, you know, this is who they want. That's their picture of a leader because they've taken a picture of the world's leader and, and then they just put him into the church and say, well, then that's what he's supposed to look like. But you remember what Jesus said? He says, you know, uh, he who wants to, you know, be greatest in the kingdom of God need to be the servant of all. The world lords it over, but not so in the kingdom of God. And so he's going to describe for them even the criteria that they should have been using to judge if they were going to judge. They even have the wrong set of criteria. So Paul is going to talk a little bit about that criteria. And then he is also going to share, you're going to see a little bit of sarcasm out of him. Okay. Maybe not a little, maybe a lot of sarcasm uh, is going to come out of Paul in this. And then he's going to create some some great contrast and he's going to really drive home uh, the point of, uh, of what spiritual maturity actually is going to look like compared to what their view of it is. Today in the church, there, there are many who believe that, uh, that God is interested in helping you get everything that you ever wanted in your life. And, and so there is this... You know, we have this church growth mentality that that has bought into this. We also have prosperity doctrine that buys into this. And and when you are trying to use God to get where you want to go, you're in the wrong equation. You're in the wrong equation. God's not interested in helping you get where you want to go. God's interested in getting you where he wants you to go. And and so this is about submission and about letting God lead you and guide you. The other is an attempt to take and control God and the power of God to use that as an engine in your life to get you where you want to go. 
And that is just heresy. It is just heresy. It is just self-oriented, self-gratification, self-fulfillment. That's the world. But what the world did is they took that self-fulfillment, self-gratification, and then they pasted it into Christianity. And now you can use God to help you get everything you ever wanted. And, And boy, I'll tell you something. That sounds good. That sells. I mean, you can fill seats up when you start telling people you can get everything you ever want in your entire life. That, that, you, your flesh, boy, give it to me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm ready. I want a flesh feast. I can use God to have a flesh feast in my life. Man, sign me up. You know, how much do I need to pay for that? And what seminar do I need to go to that? And, and, and so that appeals, uh, that appeals to the flesh. But Jesus, he wasn't about, he didn't tell you, come fulfill your flesh, pick up your cross and follow me. I don't think that's quite how the verse went there. He said, crucify your flesh. You got to die to where you want it to go. You got to trust the one that's going to lead you because he's going to lead you to a far better place than you ever would have gone. Self-gratification is emptiness. It's hollow. It's destruction. It's division. That's where it's going to take you. And everything is going to crumple in your life. When you put a group of selfish people together where everybody is just seeking to fulfill themselves, it, it, it turns on itself and it ultimately is destroyed, whether that's in a marriage or a family or in a church or in any structure. We see unity comes by love and sacrifice and by taking and exalting above self what is a greater good. This is where unity and this is the path that God calls us to. But narrow is that gate. Difficult it is to walk on it because the world's screaming, fulfill yourself. And then you even have the churches that are broadcasting, fulfill yourself. But that's not the voice of the Lord. And so Paul is seeing that this message is even inside the church there in Corinth. And he is going to absolutely address that issue because he loves this church and he loves the people. So let's start, shall we? Uh, (laughs) And then we'll close in prayer. (laughs) All right, verse 1, here we go. Chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. Uh, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So what are the two words that he uses here to describe church leaders? He says servants and stewards. And so uh, here we see a servant. What is a servant? Now, normally in the scriptures, when you see the word servant, normally the word in Greek underneath that is doulos. It means a bond servant, someone who is connected to their master out of love and devotion. But that's not the word that's used here. Paul uses a different word here. And the word actually would be, describes the person who is in the big ships that they had, the big cargo ships. It was the group of under rowers that were there that sat on those benches through, rowed through the windows, sat in bilge water and the smell and the dark and the dank and underneath and just rowed. And they just did exactly what they're told. They didn't ask questions. They weren't in charge of anything. They just simply did what they were instructed. Paul is saying that as a church leader, you're just following the instructions of the Lord. You're just an under rower. That you're not a person that's in charge of anything because the Lord is the one that's in charge of everything. Uh, and so the picture of, you know, powerful boss that gets to do whatever he wants, that's not what a church leader is. A church leader is someone that's learned just to labor, keep their mouth shut, and just do what you're told and just take your instructions from the Lord much different than this glorious picture that they had in in mind of church leader. He says, servant under rower, sitting in bilge water and just rowing. Is that glamorous? That glorious? That the picture of success, uh, you know, in the world? But but that's what it's about. My life is not my own. I've been bought at a price now. And so I just serve the Lord with everything that's in me. That's what Paul is saying. And, and I'm a steward. I don't own anything. And the world is all about owning, you know, owning the big house, the big everything, the yacht, the planes, the hell, the whole thing. But you know what Paul says? A church leader, he's not an owner of anything. You know what he is? He's a steward. 
A steward is someone that just manages somebody else's <laughs> possessions. And, and you see, well, as a church leader, there's an entrustment with what it is <laughs> to manage over. Now, what is it that he says that he has been given to be a steward over? The mysteries of God. What's the mysteries of God? I'll put, put that. The mysteries of God is this, that Jesus Christ has come and laid down his life so that we can be saved. And that all you need to do is to invite Christ into your life and you can enter into heaven. That was the mystery that Jesus is the Messiah and that he's the Lamb of God and that we have salvation in his name. That's the mystery that has been revealed that he was given. Remember on the Damascus road? He, that is where the Lord met him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's like, who are you, you know, Lord? And suddenly now he had that mystery unveiled. And now he was going around to let everybody know about that, that mystery that the Messiah has come, the one that they had been waiting for for centuries and now had come. And so this is the mystery of God. So servant and steward, that, those were the words. He says, and moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And so as a steward, what is the necessary quality of a steward? And that is just faithfulness. It is just the ability to show up day in and day out and keep on pounding it out no matter how much adversary you come up against. And, and that's exactly, boy, if there was one word that would describe Paul, it would be faithful. When he came and founded this church, remember what a rough trip that second missionary trip was? That's when he got called over to Philippi. He had the Macedonian call, and, and he heads over, founds you know, the believers there in Philippi. But what happens? He gets arrested, gets beaten, thrown in jail. There's the earthquake, and he's delivered out. But they ask him to leave. The city leaders come and get him out of the jail and ask him to leave. So he gets beaten, arrested, kicked out, and then asked to leave. He goes down to Thessalonica, and he gets kicked out of there. They ask him to leave. He goes down to Bria. They chase him out of there. He goes down to Athens, and... And now he's with the intellectuals and the philosophers at Mars Hill. And he makes no progress with them whatsoever. He comes down into Corinth. And he has just had this rough missionary trip. But he just keeps on following after the Lord. Faithfulness. Success is persevering in whatever it is that God has called you to do. That's success. That's in the kingdom of God. But that's not how the world defines success. Perseverance to what God has called you to do. Do and be what God has called you to do and persevere in it no matter what. He says in verse 3, but with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I, I do not even judge myself. And so Paul is, you know, there's people coming up to Paul. Paul, do you want to know where you are in the standings? You know, we've been putting out our weekly judge and you've been slipping a few points. Let me tell you what, you know what Paul's answer was? I don't care. <laughs> Read my lips. I don't care about uh, your judgment uh, uh, of me. He says, I don't care what you think of me because you're not the one that commissioned me to be doing what I'm doing. He says, I don't care if I get arrested and thrown into prison and I'm brought before courts. I don't care what the courts think about my ministry. The courts have no authority. This, is the, this isn't, the, my, my authority isn't in the realm of the government and in the laws of the land. He says, I don't care what the courts think about me. He says, I don't even care what I think about myself. He says, I'm not a good judge of myself. And you know what? That's actually very true. We are not good judges of ourselves. And the reason that we're not good judges of ourselves, we're not objective. <laughs> we are so subjective with ourselves. And, and on both ends of the extreme, number one, we can be very liberal with ourselves, can't we? You know, we're hard on others and we're easy on ourselves. And we can lean in that direction. But then we can also go in the other direction. We can be very hard on ourselves too hard on ourselves. And, and so what we, we have difficulty with is finding that middle balance when it comes to judging ourselves. But he goes on to say in verse 4, For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. So here what he's saying is that when we pause before we jump into the Word of God and, and we reflect and, and we ask the Lord, we have a time of reflection and confession, personal confession of sin. 
and, and we're just examining ourselves before the Lord. Lord, is there, is there anything? Well, when Paul does that, he says, you know what? I'm good. I don't have any outstanding issues with the Lord. There's nothing that I know of that's unconfessed. There's, there's no sin that I'm aware of that's going on in my life. But he says that I'm aware of. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that there isn't sin in my life. There just isn't any sin in my life that I am aware of. But the Lord can reveal that and bring conviction upon us. And as we are sanctified, he starts with the grosser sins in our lives, and then he starts to move to the subtler sins in our lives. And here we see that Paul is saying that as far as I know, when I judge myself, uh, there isn't anything that I am aware of. But that's why I'm not made righteous by my own declaration of that. But I don't even take stock in that because that is still not a complete examination. There's one who is able to examine us, who knows the the secrets, he knows the inside, he knows everything. And he's the only one that can judge us. And that's where Paul is going to go. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts then each one's praise will come from God. When people are judging each other, oh, you're so wonderful. No, no, man, you're the best. No, you're even better. That's so good. You know, and they're just, and the the praise is going, you know, that's here. He says, God's the one that's going to judge. And the only praise that's important to Paul is the praise that's going to come from God. He wants to hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and turn to the kingdom. He doesn't care what the... What the people think, he doesn't care what the government thinks. He doesn't even care his own evaluation. It's just the Lord's evaluation. That's what he is living for. And so, each one's praise is going to come from God. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Now, what is he saying? Remember, he just described himself as a servant and a steward. He's saying, okay, I'm not really a servant, I'm not really a steward. Okay, I'm just, these are figurative, these are expressions to help you understand what a church leader is supposed to look like. And and he says that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. What does he mean by that? He is saying there that when we evaluate one another and ourselves, that we need to be looking through the lens of the word of God. What is written? Don't evaluate beyond what is written. Use the standards of the word of God when we evaluate things. He says that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. When we start using any other subjective form of evaluation from the world, it's not going to have any merit. It's not going to have any merit. Well, you know, we'll, we'll choose the pastor by height. It's like, what? You know, I mean, that has, it's, it's, there's no merit in that. Where, where is that in the Word of God? Where is that in the Word of God? We're to use the Word of God as our standard. And beyond that, that's just, that's just the world. And, and it's subjective. So he goes on now because they were competing with each other. So when you're competing with each other, there's those who are winning the competition. You know, we are the super Christians. And then there's the loser Christians over there. They're not up to our standard here. And, and so this is what was going on in the Corinthian church. So Paul now is going to talk about the fact that when you say they're less and you exalt them and you put them down, let's talk about this for a minute. Who made all of them? God's the one that made every single one of us. And secondly, God is the one that distributed all the gifts and all the details to each and every one of us. And and so when you are doing this, how are you taking and judging based upon the fact that every single one of us has received every single thing that we have from God? So how can you judge if everybody's the recipient of grace and if it's all grace, everything that we have, then why are you proud? Why are you making these distinctions here? So verse seven, for who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did (laughs) indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And so now in verse eight, listen to his sarcasm. He says, you are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign that we also might reign with you. 
He's saying, my, 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 you Corinthians, you've got it all going on, don't you? I mean, you are all that in the ham sandwich, aren't you? I mean, you are just, you are mature, you're intelligent, you're spiritual, you're capable of judging the, uh, the leaders that, that are going around and, and investing into God's people. Uh, and so here we see the, 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 the sarcasm that, that he is using here. He says in verse 9, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And Paul says that, you know, he's an apostle. He says, but where is the status of the world for an apostle? He says, you know what we are? We're made a spectacle. Now, the reference that he's using there, they would have understand exactly what he's talking about. A spectacle was uh, was a parade. And it was the parade that the Romans would throw. And it was after they had conquered an enemy that they would have this giant parade that would come right down Main Street in Rome there. And the first would come the generals. And then the army and ticker tape parade. I mean, this is, they're giving honor. Second, <laughs> all the, 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 the treasures and the art and everything that they conquered from them would now be on display as it would go by and the crowds would be cheering. And then last, last would come the conquered enemy soldiers that would now be in chains. And they would be last and they would be the ones that were now headed for the Colosseum. And they would become gladiators and they would have to fight for their very lives. Paul says, we are those men right there. That's the status that we have in in the world. As apostles, we've just been made spectacles. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. And to the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. Ah! You work with your own hands? Are you kidding me? This uh, is now what the Greeks, because the Greeks, they were into intellectualism and philosophy and culture and all that. They thought to work with your own hands, that is like the lowest of the low. And so, you know, Paul says we're beaten, we're, you know, we're poor, we're, we're homeless, and we work with our hands. And they're just like, oh, terrible. This because remember, what are they they're doing? They're looking at these church leaders as these rock stars. But, but they're measuring them. They want the world's rock star to be the leader. And he says, this is, this is what an apostle of Jesus Christ looks like. He says, we labor relentlessly. We get no recognition. We get no praise. That's not what we're here for. That's not why we do what we do. He says, we're being reviled. He says, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. And, and here we see that this is, that this is the Christian response to injustices in our lives. And, and when we are reviled, we're supposed to bless. And, and when we're persecuted, we're supposed to endure. And when we are defamed, we're to just entreat. He says, we have been made as the filth of the world, the off scouring of all things until now. This is the exact opposite of the respect and the admiration of the rock star pastor. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. He says, I love you. I'm a dad. And you're my kid. So, you know what? I want to have a father-son conversation with you. And, and because I love you, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and talk to you and get real with you and get into your face about some things that are really going wrong. And if you keep on doing these things, things are going to get even worse. And it's that paternal care. He says, I'm willing to say the hard things to you, the things that nobody else will say. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what's right. I love you. And you can have a lot of instructors. 
But every single one of us has one person that was the instrument that God used to lead them to Christ. Paul says, that's me. So let me lay it down with you. Let me get real with you so that you really hear the truth of these things. He says in verse 16, therefore I urge you, imitate me. Imitate me. Now, once again, <laughs> Paul wasn't on their top 20 list <laughs> of leaders when they were using their list of how they were evaluating. Paul wasn't <laughs> the one that they were saying they wanted to imitate. But Paul is saying that he is the one that has been commissioned by Christ. Follow after him. He says in verse 17, For this reason I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul is in the middle of an explosion that's going on in Ephesus. The church is just going crazy. They are ministering. Remember, he says that effective fervent doors opened up into us here into Asia. That's Ephesus. And they are they have just got so much work that's going on out there. And Paul's saying, I cannot leave right now to come down and help you guys. But I care about you. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Timothy right now. And Timothy, he's my troubleshooter. He can come in and he will help you guys get this thing back on the right track again. He's going to teach you the same things that I have been teaching and I teach everywhere. So he really gets it. He really understands it. He's really going to be able to help you. So listen to him when he comes, listen to what he has to say. So I'm going to send you help. Now he says in verse 18, now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. So there were some who were, uh, who were believing that Paul was afraid to visit them, that, that now that they really had arrived, that, that, that Paul really didn't have any authority there any longer. They were kind of past Paul and that they, Paul was afraid to even show up in Corinth. And Paul's like, are you kidding me? I am not afraid to, to show up there in, in Corinth. He says, but when I show up, I'm not going to show up with empty words. I'm going to show up with the power of God. And so he says, for the kingdom of God, verse 20, is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love in a spirit of gentleness? And so Paul, Paul puts the ball back into their court. And says, when I get there, either way, either address these issues, get them cleaned up and get them turned around. Or when I come, we'll deal with these issues. Or if you get them cleaned up and turned around, then, man, we can go on to other things when I visit. And we can dwell together in unity and in peace. Your choice, either way. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for a minute back to verse 5. Because it was there in verse 5 where he says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. <clears throat> now, what's interesting to me and where, where I just sat on that was that every single one of us, there is a reality for us that we are going to one day take our last breath. And then, do you know what? Then time is up here. And, and the context of this was for believers. Now, the issue wasn't salvation because we're already saved. And he's saying that, that when we breathe our last breath, we're not going to be able to do any more for the kingdom of God. That's it. That's as much as you got to do. And remember that all of our works as Christians that we did for the Lord are going to get passed through the fire. They're going to get tested. And only those things that were truly done for the Lord, they're going to remain. They're going to come out on the other side. And so, and so that's what Paul was saying here that... Uh, not to judge anything before the time. In other words, God is the one that's going to judge it. He's going to judge it after it goes through the fire. Don't look at how big the pile is before it goes in. <laughs> Stand on the other side and see what comes out <laughs> before you start getting impressed uh, w with what everybody has been doing. So don't judge anything before the time. Everybody stay focused, keep on working, keep on serving the Lord, and then the Lord is going to call time in your life. And then it's like a teacher when they say pencils down. And say, oh, I, I, I knew four more answers. I just, can I just, ah, get the pencil down. It's not what you knew. It's not whether you knew those four answers. It's did you write the answers down or not? Because your time's up. And when our time is up, our time's up. And the thing is, we never know when that time is going to be up. 
God knows, but we don't know. When he says time, set your pencil down. And, and that's a reality for us as Christians, but I want you to know it's a reality for every single person. There is a moment when God is going to say to every single person on the face of the earth, up, oh, your time's up. No more, set your pencil down. And then every single one of us is going to go stand before God. And as I was thinking about that, and there is the glory of the Lord that's before us. There are those that are going to stand before God and they're going to be clothed in their own righteousness. Their own robe is going to be their, their own actions in their lives. What does that mean? It means when they stand before God, they stand before it with this robe that is stained with every single sin they ever committed in their entire life. Every single sin staining this robe that they're standing before God. I want you to imagine what that looks like. When your whole life of sin is all now on display at one moment. Or they're going to stand before the Lord in the righteousness of Christ with a pure, white, undefiled garment where every single sin has been washed away and forgiven and they're standing before the Lord. And every single person has one of those two robes on. Has one of those two robes. And to the person that stands there in the muck and the mire and the sin of their life before the glory, holy, awesome God, they're here going to hear God say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You cannot bring your sin into heaven. And the person who is robed in the righteousness of Christ, the gates of heaven are going to swing open and God is going to say, welcome into the kingdom of God. Enter in. And what Paul was so passionate about was that Paul wanted to make sure that every single person had a robe of the righteousness of Christ. Because you see, there is a robe that God has fashioned that's exactly your size. Just fits you absolutely and perfect. And when you put that robe on, your sins are washed away and you stand before God in the righteousness of, not your righteousness, the righteousness of Christ and before Him. Jesus told the story about the wedding feast that was going on and everybody was invited and those that didn't come, and then he went into the highways and byways and invited until they were all full. And then the king came in, and he saw that everybody had their wedding garments on, except one person. And he walked up to that one person, and he said, Friend, how did you get in here without the garment? And that person had no answer for and the king called the servants, come, take him, bind him, and cast him and throw him out. Lock the doors behind him. And he was cast out. Every single one of us is going to stand before God. And we're either going to stand thinking that, you know what, I didn't have as many sins as some people, or I had done some nice things, or I did a lot of nice things. But what is that compared to the muck and the mire and the sin in their life? And and Paul just wanted, if Paul was here right now, Paul would want to sit down with every single one of us and just ask you one question. Are you in your own robe or do you have the robe of Christ? Do you have the robe of Christ? Did you put on the robe of Christ? Do you have the robe of Christ? Do you have the robe of righteousness? And that's all he wants to know. He says, and if you don't, let's get you one right now. And I want you to know they're free. They don't cost you anything. They are expensive. They were made in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But for you, all you have to do is ask, and God will give you that robe, and you will stand in front of Him, and you will be received into eternity for heaven, forever. And every single one of us were either 
in our own robes or we're in the robes of righteousness of Christ. And, and that is the one thing that is burning on Paul's heart. And, and this morning, I couldn't possibly close this service without giving every single person an opportunity to be able to make sure that you have got the robe of righteousness of Christ. All you need to do is ask. That's all you need to do. Just accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and He will put the robe of righteousness upon you. And when you stand before God, all of your sin has been washed away, and you'll stand before Him robed in the righteousness of Christ. And so we're going to do a worship song right now. And, And if the Lord was to call you into His presence... Do you know that you have the robe of righteousness of Christ on you this morning? And if not, then I want you to, as quick as you possibly can, jump out of your seat and run down here and get a robe, the righteous robe of Christ that we can put you upon. All you need to do is to ask. And so if that's you, if you recognize and understand, it doesn't matter how many church services you've been to, doesn't matter how many times you've worshipped or how much Christian music or if you have a Bible or not. doesn't matter if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and, and that he resurrected. It matters whether or not you have received your robe and put your robe on. And if not, then you don't want to stand before God in your own sin in front of him. And this morning is your opportunity right now to get out of your seat, to use the free will that God gave to you, to exercise that free will, to jump up and say, yes, I want that righteousness of Christ. I need that righteousness of Christ. So this is your moment. This is your chance. Stand up and come now if you want to receive uh, the robe of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. Stand and come now.